the second sounds, which turned out to be the sounds of a cricket bat striking against the door, could not have been those of the deceased as she had then suffered devastating injuries. Mrs. Van de Merve, who woke up around 1.56 to hear a one-sided argument later had four gunshots in close succession. Her estimation was that it was about three o'clock. Soon thereafter, she heard someone crying out loud. It seemed to her that it was a woman's voice, but her husband told her that it was the accused crying. Although it was not established how her husband knew that it was the accused who was crying, this piece of evidence is enough to throw some doubt on the evidence of the witnesses who were adamant that they had heard a woman scream. Dr. and Mrs. Stipp gave evidence that the screaming was heard between the first and the second sounds. Mr. and Mrs. Ntlenget was evidence was that the crying out loud occurred shortly after the first sounds. This version has a ring of truth. I say this because Mr. Ntlengetwa called security at 3.16.36 to report the crying out loud. Lending credence to this is the evidence of Mr. Johnson and Ms. Berger, which was that the screaming occurred between approximately 3.12 and 3.17. Mrs. Steep's time seemed to be wrong as it does not accord with the times of other witnesses. She relied on her radio clock to estimate the time of the events as they unfolded. According to her, when she woke up, the clock showed 3.02. She stated that her clock would have been three minutes early. She was about to get up when she heard three sounds which sounded like gunshots. She communicated this to her husband, who, having left the bedroom earlier to go to the big bal balcony, returned to the bedroom to make a phone call. At 3.15.51, Dr. Stipp made a call to security, and then at 3.17, he attempted to call 10.11. The timing of the call to security is important, as it is an indication that the time when Mrs. Stipp heard the gunshots must have been much later than 300 hours too. I say this because from their evidence, it is clear that both Mr. and both Dr. and Mrs. Mrs. Stipp regarded the incident as an emergency, which warranted prompt action. And there seems to be no reason why they would delay seeking help. Hence, as counsel for the defense correctly argued, it is unlikely that Mrs. Stipp would take as long as 13 minutes before she and her husband could respond to the emergency. It is more probable that the time Mrs. Stipp had shots was much later than the time that she mentioned. What is interesting is that Mr. Johnson, too, made his first call at 3.16. This call was made to Strubenskop security. <coughs> this time is closer to the time mentioned by the Stipps as the time Dr. Stipps made a call to security. Johnson made, made the call soon after he and his wife, Ms. Berger, had heard what they described as a woman screaming. They also heard a man shout help three times. It was only after this that they heard what they described as gunshots. It is clear from the rest of the evidence that these were actually sounds of a cricket bat striking against the toilet door. Mrs. Motswane, a neighbor of the accused, woke up to hear men crying very loudly. 
In a statement, she stated that when she heard a man cry out loud, it was about 3.20. This estimation, too, in my view, cannot be relied on, as it was more like guessing, as she did not look at her time when she got up. What is also interesting about the evidence of Ms. Mrs. Motswane is that although she was an immediate neighbor of the accused, she did not hear the shots, but woke up when she heard a man crying. At the time the second sounds were heard, Ms. Dr. Stipp was on the phone trying to call 10 he described what he heard as three loud bangs, while Mrs. Stipp described the same sounds as three th third sounds. The number of these loud bangs or third sounds, as well as the time, is consistent with the version of the accused that soon after he had realized that the person behind the toilet door might have been the deceased he ran to the balcony from where he screamed for help, took the cricket bat, and proceeded to the bathroom where he struck the, struck the toilet door three times with the cricket bat. Having dealt with the gunshots and the cricket bat sounds, the next question is can the version of the accused that he is the one who was screaming on the morning of 14 February 2013 reasonably possibly be true. It is important to, re to recap the state's theory, which was that the accused and the deceased had an argument in the early hours of that morning, an argument that was heard by Mrs. Van de Merve, that the deceased fled to the toilet, that the accused followed her there, and in the heat of further argument, the accused shot and killed her. In support of this theory, state counsel pointed to, among other things, that the accused had, I'll have to rephrase that. In support of this, state, this theory, State Council pointed to the fact that, amongst other things, the deceased had a cell phone with her and had, had locked herself <coughs> inside the toilet. In my view, there could be a number of reasons why the deceased felt mm -hmm. the need to take her cell phone with her to the toilet. One of the possible reasons may be that the deceased needed to use her cell phone for lighting purposes as the light in the toilet was not working. To try to pick just one reason would be to delve into the realm of speculation. The state also led the evidence of WhatsApp messages that went to and fro the accused and the deceased a few weeks before the deceased was killed. The purpose of such evidence was to demonstrate to this court that the relationship between the accused and the deceased was on the rocks and that the accused had a good reason to want to kill the deceased. In a bid to persuade this court otherwise, the defendant or the defense placed on record more WhatsApp messages that painted a picture of a loving couple. In my view, none of this evidence from the state or from the defense proves anything. Normal relationships are dynamic and unpredictable most of the times, while human beings are fickle. Neither the evidence of a loving relationship nor of a relationship turned sour can assist this court to determine whether the accused had the requisite intention to kill the deceased. For that reason, this court refrain, refrains from making inferences one way or the other in this regard. 
There is also the matter of partially digested food that Professor Simon found in the stomach of the deceased body during the post-mortem examination <coughs> of the deceased. Council for the State submitted that this fact was a strong indication that a dinner was not at 1900 hours the night before as alleged by the accused, but closer to the time when the deceased was shot dead. He argued that that would explain the, I quote, argument, close quote, that was heard by Mrs. van der Merve just after she had woken up at 1.56. This argument seems to lose sight of the following. <coughs> One, that the experts agreed that gastric emptying was not an exact science. It would therefore be unwise for this court to even attempt to figure out what the presence of partially digested food might mean, as the evidence before this court is inconclusive. However, even if this court were to accept that the deceased had something to eat shortly before she was killed, it would not assist the state, as the inference sought to be drawn by the state from this fact is not the only reasonable inference. She might have left the bedroom while the accused was asleep to get something to eat. What complicates this, this matter is that it is not even clear when and if the alarm was activa activated at any given time that evening or that morning. Two, that Mrs. van der Merve had no idea where the voice came from, what language was being spoken, or what was being said. Accordingly, there is nothing in the evidence of Mrs. van der Merve that links what, sound, what sounded like an argument to her to the incident at the house of the accused. What is of significance, however, is that Mr. Peter Barber, the security guard, was near the house of the accused at 2.20 on patrol. There is no evidence that Mr. Barber heard or saw anything untoward at the accused house at the time. <clears throat>